Buddy. Glory. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Yes, amen. amen. And to be here on this first night of youth convention. And uh, to know what God's going to do for us the rest of the nights. Yes. So good to have this first night underway. Bound to be because a lot of you haven't been here the other nights. So the rest of us came a little early and we had a couple of nights of service to get ready. So when you got here for the first night of this youth convention and so uh, I think you're having a hard time catching up with where the rest of us have been in the last couple of nights service. And so what we're going to do is we're going to let you catch up. And we're going to take time out for about five minutes, hallelujah, and the rest of us are just going to stand here, and we're going to let you worship and glorify God until you get up the dimension where the rest of us are, and then we'll just pick up from there and go ahead and have church, amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I'll tell you what, there's been a presence of the Holy Ghost in this place night after night. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. I... I'll tell you what, there has been, uh, there's been an awesomeness of God in this place. I, I, again, and I don't want to sound repetitious, but I've been in a lot of, lot of gatherings. But I don't know too many more that I've been in that I've felt a greater awesomeness. Well, I've seen more shouting. I've seen more running. I've seen more miracles. I've seen more get the Holy Ghost. But... There's been an awesomeness of the presence of God every night in this service. I have to believe that God is doing something to us in these services. And if He's not, we're wasting our time and God's time by being here tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory. I just feel like that we need to bring our hearts and minds and spirits into this service tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you love the Lord again tonight? Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. Praise the name of the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated tonight. And it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Praise God. And uh, I would ask you to... Remember me in prayer tonight. I have not felt well all day. I have been uh, uh, much in pain and suffering very much today. In fact, I've had to stay in bed most of the day. Not felt well at all, but uh, it takes more than that to keep me out of the pulpit. Hallelujah. Amen. And then on top of that, when you're a long way away from your church and, and you have a death connected with the church, and, and on top of that, you got somebody wanting to quit their husband. Amen. Uh, God have mercy. Well, go ahead and do it. Amen. You don't care no more to be saved than that. I get so tired of us preachers having to be the voice of the conscience of people. And if God ever got you where he wanted you, there's worlds of things that you require out of us preachers. That ain't no more the will of God for us to do than nothing. I told my church the other day, so I said, I don't care where you live. Don't ask me about what kind of house for you to buy. I don't care what kind of car you drive. Don't ask me whether it's a will of God or not. God didn't call me to be a used car salesman. Well, Brother Spears should, uh, you know, we've been thinking about buying a, 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 a piano at the house. You know, should we, should we buy it or not? I don't care whether you do or not. God didn't call me to decide whether you to buy pianos or not. I have a funny feeling. Let me give you a little key that always, I should have told you this the first night is that when I stand before I ever open the book, now when I open the book, I know where I'm going. 
But when I stand up there, the first part, I'm just, just kind of. And when a congregation gets quiet on me, I know I have found a soft spot. So the thing to do is be a hypocrite. Just, you know, just worship and praise God. Everything I say, hallelujah. That will make me get quicker into the word, hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah. Sometimes we preachers come to the pulpit, and we've had to worry with so much junk before we ever get there. And then you grumble and find fault when we get through out of the pulpit and we haven't been able to deliver our heart. And then somebody goes off and said, Boy, sure sound like you had a struggle tonight. Well, the struggle started on the way to to the pulpit or on the way to the congregation when somebody wanted to know about something that didn't amount to a hill of beans and didn't have anything to do with God. Hallelujah. Brother Spears, could I talk to you just a minute? I know it's church time, and, but I, I tell you what, my, if something don't happen in our family, I, I just tell you, I just don't know what to do. Well, don't ask me. I, I didn't get you into that problem. I didn't tell you who to marry. My kids are driving me insane. I didn't tell you to have them. Brother Spirit, I don't know what I'm going to do if God don't help us financially some way. You see, God does not run around and deliver us out of everything that we call on God to do. God gives us some reasoning to figure out some things before something happens a long way down the road. And when we make up our mind, God is the kind of God that He will not cross what you want. Whatever you desire. It didn't, it didn't make He has a will for you, but he will not cross what you desire. Somebody said, oh, Brother Spirit, now just a minute. All right. Take your hand and put it in a burning oven. God will not send an angel down to pull your hand out of that fire. He put enough up here. Keep that out of here. Oh, I know I got some game. That's the reason I'm just taking my time. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And and, and then we wonder sometime when we preachers stand in the pulpit. And, and, uh, uh, you know, there's some things that... uh, uh, people demand of us and ask of us and and want us to do that they could find the answer for themselves. But the reason human beings don't want to find the answer, they don't want to take the blame for whatever the consequences is. And they want to take their choice and then when it don't work out, look back and say, you told me to do it, preacher. Oh, Lord. It, you'd be better y'all just get up and dance. I mean, be hypocrites. My God, just kick over chairs. Hallelujah. That, that threw me off. That let me know I wasn't hitting nobody. You say, oh, no, no, Brother Spirit. Hey, friend, I've been in this long enough to find out when people usually shout and worship, you ain't even hitting them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, we don't run aisles and jump and hoop and holler when somebody's grinding our corn. <laughs> oh, no. 
we just flop down and get a hold of the chair and say, oh, Jesus, bless him, God, hallelujah, amen, God, help him hurry up and get into the sermon, God, hallelujah, you know, God, hallelujah, i got to go home after a while, Lord, hallelujah, and I want to hear your will while I'm in this sermon. You're hearing it right now. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Y'all are catching on real quick, amen. You see, everybody's starting to worship now, hallelujah. Amen, 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 hallelujah. I took the church in just a few days, it'll be nine years ago, and the uh, church I took was a great church. I do not mean it was not in any respect, but uh, it was a church that uh, nobody knew how to change a light bulb. I have people that have college degrees but they did not know how to change a light bulb at church. Now, a light bulb at the house is different from a light bulb at church. have got ready to deliver the word of God that might change the destiny of a soul and while I was trying to get to the pulpit I've had an usher to stop me and say brother Spears do you know that there are four bars of soap that has been unwrapped in the bathroom. I don't care if they unwrap them all. Come on. I think you're getting what I'm trying to get over before I ever open this book tonight. That sometimes when that man of God gets to the pulpit, all he can think about is bars of soap, <laughs> burn out light bulbs. Finally, I trained our church and our people. There's some things you just don't tell me. I don't care. Now, you can have it one of two ways. I can take the responsibility and, and do all of that and worry about that. And then when I open this book, it'll be so scatter barrel and messed up that you won't get nothing out of it. Or I can let some of that other stuff go. And when I open this book, reach down in your conscience and give you the word of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Praise God. We need to hear from the word of the Lord nowadays. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. Well, I don't charge for these sermons. No, the, the others either. Amen. I don't mean to sound facetious. Amen. But, uh, oh God, sometimes we play such foolish games with God. No wonder when we leave we haven't been any closer to God than when we got here. I have watched people before. I purposely, some years ago, left some paper laying near the entrance way to the church to see how long people would walk over it before they would pick it up. You would be surprised how many of you have looked at it and wondered why somebody else didn't do it. And then go to the preacher and say, Brother Pastor, do you know somebody put some paper down? And then you expect him. I have tried to, every night before I come to this pulpit, I have prayed God would let me talk to you about something. 
I could have walked up here and been preaching you a message already. But I purposed in my heart a long time ago. People can get so geared and so prepared for preaching that they can miss totally what you intend to tell them because they are accustomed to the slant you're fixing to come from. But I don't operate that way. I come here and stand here and throw you totally off guard until I get all of your guards down. When I open the book and start preaching in a minute, it will not be the same as if I'd have been preaching already 10 minutes ago. And I believe that's one reason the Holy Ghost has moved so strong in this building night after night is we've gotten rid of some cliches until we were open before God and God could walk in here and deal with our hearts. Because God has walked these aisles the last two nights and I believe he's going to do it again tonight. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. This is my last night to ramble on like this. My wife may be here tomorrow night and uh, I don't like to do that when she is here. Amen. Because she gets up tight and nervous. Amen. And I hate to make that little girl upset. Praise God. So tomorrow night if she's here, hallelujah, you'll notice I'll be real nice. And I will never have to tell you whether she is here or not tomorrow night by the way I come to this pulpit. Hallelujah. Amen. But aren't you glad you know the Lord tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Just about a year ago, I was preaching in a uh, uh, another country. And uh, I looked around and I, I noticed a little something that the ladies did that I just thought I'd just say something about it. Most of them wore a little hat or a little veil. So I thought I would say something about it. I'm so glad the Holy Ghost checked me just before I opened my mouth. Because I later found out that they preached there, hallelujah, that you had to have them on. So if that's what they wanted, let's go just buy them. Hallelujah. Wear them. Amen. Hallelujah. Didn't bother me. Amen. Glory to God. And I see I got some of you squirming. Because you don't know what I'm going to say next. And I've preached about everything from Dan to Beersheba in the two nights I've been here. And you don't know what I'm going to cover next. Hallelujah. One other thing I want to cover. I've talked about our attitude. Our biggest obstacle to a move of God is our attitude. Our attitude one toward the other. Our attitude of super, super, super holiness. Just a few months ago, in our own church, we had a situation that I had let go for a long, long time. I'm the kind of person, I just don't jump in and throw fits to start with. I just figure this is God's church and He wants to clean it out. Well, it's His anyway. Hmm. Who you got quiet then. I'm, I'm going to have to move on here, but I'll tell you what happened. There was an individual that I could not put my finger on their life. They were so perfect. Their sleeves were longer than anybody else's. Their dresses were longer than anybody else's. Their hair was perfect. Everything but their attitude. And that attitude set in that church and bound up a move of God. And I want to say something, and this will shock you, and I ask you young people not to let this be funny. I had rather have somebody in my church 
smoking cigarettes than to have somebody to sit in a position or in the congregation and display beautiful, beautiful, beautiful outward holiness and yet have an attitude inside that is so rotten and dirty that God cannot even move by. I'm fixing to get in the Word of God, but I'm just saying a few more things. God can bypass somebody sitting in the pew or doing some things that's not right with God, but He will not bypass people's attitude. And an attitude will stop a move of God quicker than a bunch of women sitting in church snuff-dipping. You see, we've made sure we've got the snuff, but we didn't want anybody to preach about our attitude. Oh, God, we need our attitude straightened and reamed out. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Well, everybody said praise the Lord. Because I'm through, hallelujah, and ready to preach. Amen. And everybody said hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. If you have your Bibles, open them and please stand. Honor to the Word of God. I want to begin reading tonight in the book of Psalms, the 8th Psalm. Praise God, praise God, hallelujah. And I'll tell you what happened while you're turning in your Bible. That individual that had played, that had been on our platform and had been tremendously used in years gone by, Suddenly I got a note one day that said I won't be back. And I didn't run to find out why. I didn't call. But I'll tell you what happened starting the next week. Revival broke loose. And until this hour that I stand right here in front of you, one of the most phenomenal moves of God we have seen in many years I think right at 40 adults have received the Holy Ghost in the last few weeks since that time. There has been nothing but worship and praise and adoration and glory to God. Hey, friend, all we need to do is attitude straight some things and God will rain revival down. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. I promise you that... uh, What I have said these few nights before I have preached, I ask you one thing. Please do not judge these preachers. I have not talked with them. Today I have not seen a preacher today. (laughs) And I don't know where the rest of them been. I had to leave and and go get some work done on my car. The only time I was gone and Brother uh, Kinsey told me a moment ago, he said, I called your hotel and you were gone. And I said, yes, I was good. I have tried, and somebody said, well, you come in a little bit late at night. Why why don't you do that? Amen. Sometime I do that for one reason. When I walk to this pulpit, I do not want what has happened in the first part of the service and all to cloud or bother what I feel that I need to say to you as a congregation. So do not think that I'm being disrespectful if I come in late. But sometimes, amen, I need to have everything clear out of my mind. And I think God's trying to tell all of you people, hallelujah, if your pastor begins to operate a little bit different, amen, and tries to be a little bit withdrawn from the crowd till he can get to the pulpit to deliver, please don't judge him harshly. It may be that he's trying to do you the greatest favor in all the world, and that's deliver to you the precious word of Almighty God. And I must hurry along. Psalms, the eighth chapter, or the eighth psalm it is. And I want to begin reading tonight. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens, and out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? 
and the son of man that thou wouldest visit him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Sheep, oxen, etc. so forth. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now would you turn to the book of Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans, the 8th chapter. And I want to read a rather strange scripture that has always made Pentecostal people shy away a little bit when it is stated. Romans 8 and 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate. Hey, it's there. And if you stop right there, you establish a doctrine of predestination that takes out of the will of man. But when you read the next clause, it makes all of it come a lot clearer in focus. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. To the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. One other passage, 1 John the third chapter. And this is my favorite scripture in all the Bible. 1 John the third chapter and beginning at the first verse. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. This is it. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Hallelujah. Would you join hand with somebody and pray that God would touch this preacher tonight. Father, your word is anointed. Now I pray, oh God, that some way and somehow your will would be wrought into this congregation tonight. Oh, thank you for your presence and thank you for your will and thank you for what you're going to do in this congregation tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And before you sit down, remember one thing. Anybody has a right to worship the Lord. Even the heathen has a right to worship the Lord. Everybody ought to praise and worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach tonight on probably what is in the religious ranks and in the religious world, a word that you will hear quite often, very debated, and is very controversial. Now, some of you that were at uh, Brother Kinsey's church just a few nights ago, I passed through and preached, uh, or didn't preach, I got rambling on a subject. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of what you heard that night, but I'm going to put it in full context of a message tonight. And I want to talk tonight on God's real plan of evolution. I knew I'd get your attention. God's real plan of evolution. Now, the word evolution simply means going through a state of change. It just simply means that what you are now, you will continue to change one way or the other. Now, it is God's divine law and God's divine will for us to understand the true and real purpose of salvation. 
But it is probably one of the most understood concepts in all of the ranks of the Pentecostal church. What is real salvation? What does it mean to be saved? There are so many times that we use the terminology saved in totally the wrong concept. Hallelujah. Now, when I use the word saved, and if I were to ask tonight, how many of you are saved? Practically everybody in this congregation would raise their hand. What you really mean is I have been born again. But what we are actually really after is the total will of God has not been fully wrought into our heart and life. Therefore, we are not totally finished with what God would like to do with our lives. But grace and mercy and peace be unto us And if God has his way in our life, he will change us into what he desires us to be if we yield our lives into the divine and perfect will of Almighty God. I think that some young people, and this has been a young people week, and yet I have not felt led of the Holy Ghost to make it elementary. I feel like if young people can go to school and deal with complex subjects of math and all of these things, they can come and sit in the house of God and hear the depth of the Word of God preached without having to treat them like babies. Amen. Now when we talk about, and I ask the question, are you saved? And somebody said, oh, Brother Spears, yes, I'm saved. And if I were to ask men on the street, are you saved? And how were you saved? There would be the terminology. Somebody said, oh, I believed and therefore I am saved. Somebody would say, I was born again and I am saved. And somebody else would say, well, I I was born, I was sprinkled and I went through this. But when you weigh it out that salvation is more than just the initial process that happened to you the night you were born into the kingdom of the Most High God. Hallelujah. I pray you listen to me tonight because I feel that the Holy Ghost wants to do something in this congregation right here tonight. Now I do not believe that God has invested into the church the power of the Holy Ghost merely for you and I to have been born again and at the moment of our born again experience for it to be the total completion of the work of God in our life. Hallelujah. I know that a man can be saved on the deathbed. But the longer I live, the less I believe in deathbed repentance. Not that God cannot do it, but it defies the purpose of the plan of Almighty God of salvation. For a man to live his total life in total rebellion unto the law and will of God and then at the last few moments go through some kind of process and gain the ultimate plan of salvation. That is not the will of Almighty God. God's will is to take a man. And when he takes that man, is so changed his life and so changed his concept that when God gets through with the work that he wants to wrought in that man, that that man will stand and be held as the very image and the glory of the living God in this present world and even in this generation. Amen. Glory. Oh, hallelujah. I feel an intensity of the spirit here tonight. Hallelujah. Some of David began to look and he began to question God. And he began to say, now God, I need to know something. What is man that you are mindful of him? This strange creature 
called man. Some of them look different from others. But what is it about man that you are so interested in? And then Psalm of David said, there are some things I do not understand. You've made him a little lower than the angel. Yet thou hast crowned him with glory and honor and power. But you have put all dominion of all things that you have made into his hands. Everything on the earth is under his feet. Now what David was talking about, you know today as well as I know, is that is not the process of man as we know him today. That was the process of man when God created him and placed him in the Garden of Eden. Everything was at the disposal of Adam. The world moved according to his desire. And you say, Brother Spears, how can you say that? Because the man... And Adam had the power that by his own intellect he named every animal on the face of the earth. God entrusted into him some intellect that had belonged in the mind of Almighty God. And God so made this creature from the dust of the earth. But this creature and God began a unique fellowship. And in the uniqueness of this fellowship, there began to be imparted from the eternal Elohim, the mighty God, who stretched the world out upon nothing, who called the stars by name and who could gather the wind up in his fist. But when man and God began the unique fellowship, the transition of the mind of God began to be transferred unto man. And as it was, man became the ruling supreme being on this obstacle called earth under the dominion of Almighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hang with me. Amen. Glory. Because everything was perfect in its divine order. There had to be no rain because it was perfect in the order of God. God's water sprinkling system was exactly right. There was no element severe one way or the other because Adam had a communication with God. There was a divine walking. There was a divine fellowship. And even the earth will bowed down to the will of Adam. There was nothing that was contrary to man on the face of the earth. But everything was in its divine order and in its divine process and man was the ruling and supreme being upon the face of this earth. I believe your quietness is you're listening tonight, aren't you? If you're not listening, you can get up and go in the house. Hallelujah. But anyway, then something happened that broke that fellowship. Sin entered into the earth. And when sin entered, now follow me closely. When sin entered into the earth, it severed the relationship with God and this man. Therefore, when man no longer was able to walk with God, he no longer fellowship the infinite mind of God. He no longer fellowship the infinite power of God and he became a helpless individual with no authority and with no power and with no glory. When he lost his glory, when he lost his power, the earth that had been subject unto Adam rebelled against Adam and the sun that used to not scorch his brow it began to scorch his brow and the earth gave forth thorns and thistles as in direct opposition to man and they earth says if you defy my God I will defy you and the element said if you defy our God we will defy you and so man and God went their separate way but into this divine and beautiful atmosphere of earth there came turmoil like the world has never known. Sorrow, anguish, despair, fear, murder. All of these things began to creep into this lovely place called earth. 
But somehow, let me skip now a few years. Prophets began to talk about the day that a Messiah was going to visit the earth. Men would walk and say somehow I had a visit of an intelligent being from another world. Men that some people thought was strange would come back into their village and say I do not really know who he is. But there is a supreme being who is the God of this universe. And I had an encounter with him. No, I did not see him. But my intellect, my being, my mind fellowship with the eternal whatever he is and then prophets begin to have an encounter with God oh I feel the Holy Ghost in this place hallelujah amen, amen. and then you talk about the mystery and the glory that begin to be wrought when God got closer in contact with man and man got in closer contact with God let me hurry along now I don't have time to build the story for these years but now it's Mount Moriah it's some years later a man walks on top of, of a mountain and for 40 days he stays in the very presence of almighty God his name is Moses and when he comes down the side of that mountain there is something that has transformed and transpired about him and the Bible declares that when he came down from off of that mountain he had to put a veil on his face because the glory that he had fellowship with of this eternal God that this man called Moses began to take on the action and the look like God that men could not behold him because he was being transformed and changed into the likeness of the God that he was fellowshipping with Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. The whole earth had been in direct opposition to God. But when that man Moses walked off of that mountain with a veil upon his face, millions of people stood in the hot desert sand and worshipped a golden calf. But this man walked up to the calf. He tore it down and cast it aside. Not one man raised their finger against Moses. You know why? He had enough likeness. He looked like enough of this intellectual being called God. That men looked at him and they recognized and realized God when they began to look at him. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel it. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. And then the story goes that a high priest would come out once a year and he would come out of that holy of holy. And when he would get outside, somebody would say, tell us what it's like on the inside. And he would say, ooh, it's awesome in there. All I know, and I'm going to preach on this tomorrow night, so I'm not going to go very far into it. He said, all I know is that in that shadowy cloud, in that veil, there is a power, and there is a voice, and there is an authority, that when I stand in its presence, I'm overcome by it. And when I walk out of it, I cannot forget where I've been. They called it Shekinah. They called it the presence of Almighty God. Somehow burning in the heart of mankind was the desire. If that God lives somewhere, I want to find that God. And I want to fellowship with that God some way and somehow. Oh, oh hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory. Hang with me. I'm having to hurry tonight. I'm covering too much territory in too quick a time. But you can read between the lines. The Shekinah and the glory was so powerful he could not forget it. He longed for the day when he could go back in. But then we stand at Solomon's temple now and the priests are standing ready to minister. The singers are ready to sing and everything is ready and all of a sudden something happens that's never happened before. The Shekinah, the glory, the presence, the invisible deity decides to walk near man and when he walks through men became so frightened because the natural eye had never seen that 
much glory and that much visible manifestation of the glory of Almighty God and the minds of men said I can't handle it and the Bible said the singers took off running and the preachers took off running and the saints took off running because of the glory of the God hallelujah hallelujah oh hallelujah oh I wish I had three hours tonight I'd take every last minute of it preaching on this message I wouldn't leave nothing out I'm going to leave something out and I'm afraid I'm just a hurry but one day let's pass on through time now 400 long years silent heaven locked up God puts out a out of business sign on the front door 400 years not a dream not a vision nothing heaven is locked up and all of a sudden a priest walks into the tabernacle into the temple and while he is there going about his duty an angel appears unto him could y'all stay a little bit later than 9 30 if I preach a little longer tonight all right hallelujah I, I, I'm not going to be through by 9.30 and I already know it and I'm just telling you now. Hallelujah. Thank you for all of you that voted and the majority rules and the rest of you. I dare you to get up and leave. Hallelujah. Amen. And so it was that that angel said, hey, something's fixing to happen. And he said, what is it? And he said, now your baby, your wife is going to have a baby. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I think you can figure the rest of the story out. Anyway, they had a baby after a while. But during the course of while this lady was pregnant with this baby, another lady, an angel, comes to her. Now, she's only about, some say 16, some say 18, some say 20. I don't really know. All I know is that the book said she was a virtuous girl. And an angel came to her and said, Now, Mary, blessed art thou, that which is conceived in thee. Get this, friend. You've got to remember this statement I'm saying right now. That which is conceived of thee is of the Holy Ghost. Now, we don't believe in two gods. We believe in one God operating in different manifestations. Hallelujah. And so it was that Mary locked into her heart that whatever this phenomenon was, and don't be too critical of the poor girl, because you'd have been mixed up too if you had to go home and tell your mama and daddy this far-fetched story and tell the man you was fixing to get married to, said, now, now honey, you ain't going to believe this. Now, mom and daddy, y'all not going to believe this. Now, I know you say it can't be, but I'm fixing to have a baby, and I have never had an affair with a man. Nobody believed her, and you wouldn't have either if you'd have lived there. You no, know, you see, we're seeing the other side of the story, and we say, well, I'd have believed it. You wouldn't have believed it like nobody else believed it. It's too far-fetched to believe. But all she knew was whatever, get this, whatever this Holy Ghost was, that it had conceived in her, and she was going to bring forth something into this world that was going to be an experience expression glory an expression a visible image in the form of a baby of the likeness of something that was not humanly possible but yet it was coming to pass through a human body oh hallelujah hallelujah oh glory hallelujah Oh, I hate to leave out that. Let me just take time and put this in. And so Mary goes over to her cousin's house. And when she gets over to her cousin's house, the, Mary walks to the door, rings the doorbell, or knocks on the door. I don't know how they did it. Don't ask me. Hallelujah. All I know is Elizabeth got to the door. And when she opened the door, Mary said, Let me tell you something. Nobody else will believe this. Tell me I'm not having a nightmare. Tell me I'm not going crazy. 
I know it's never been before. They tell me that I'm crazy. But something inside of me, it says I'm going to have a baby. And that baby is produced by the Holy Ghost, which means the Holy Spirit, which means the eternal Elohim, which means that Shekinah that they told us about at Solomon's temple, which means the Shekinah that's in the Holy of Holies. And she said, it's in me. It's in me. And I'm fixing to have a baby by it. And when she said that, that 90-year-old grandma that never had had a baby was standing there with her smock on. And when she said that, that baby in her turned to flip and kick both heels and if he could have said hallelujah he would have said it because the spirit of man caught a glimpse of the glory of the Shekinah that was fixing to become visible in the present earth in the form of man oh hallelujah 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 so it was that he was born. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. Oh, I have often wondered, Brother Colburn, how it must have felt when Mary picked up that baby and held it in her arms and the thought run through her mind. No earthly human being has ever held God to their bosom but what you are holding is the expressed image of almighty God and she held it close to her oh hallelujah 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 glory and the baby that lay and nursed at the breast of Mary pardon me for being plain he was the expression nursing at the breast but he was the expression of the invisible God that furnished the nourishment from the body that fed the baby in the arms of Mary hallelujah and when men looked at the baby they saw what Moses fellowship with on top of the mountain and they saw what the priest saw in the holy of holy and they felt what the people felt at Solomon's temple but now they could see it and behold the expression of the image of Almighty God I'm just now getting to what I want to preach about it's taken that long to lay the message or lay the foundation because the next statement I will make you will immediately know what I'm fixing to preach on the rest of the, the, rest of the, uh, the two hours hallelujah Amen. One day, one day, Mary is standing in the crowd. And that's her, that's her boy out there. And so she's happy to hear him talk. And, and she's pondered everything that ever happened. And she's listening to him. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, she realizes that uh, uh, her, there is a, a, a nephew that, of hers that is a preacher. And so uh, she hears him begin to say, Now, this Messiah that's coming after me, he shall baptize you. Some of you done forgot what I told y'all to remember. He shall baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. And when he said that, Mary's eyes almost bugged out. I knew y'all had forgotten it. Because her mind went back to a few years ago when an angel came to her and said, That which is conceived of thee is of the Holy Ghost. And when she beheld the glory expression of Almighty God, she began to wonder if the Holy Ghost produced in me the baby, which is the Son of God, what will it do inside of us when it comes inside of us? What is it going to produce? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I don't think that nobody but the preachers and a few of you caught what I said. And I'm going to carry it back over again. Mary looked at the image. Mary looked at the image. She looked at her son. And she said, come here, you're not good enough to be Jesus, amen. But we'll just play that. Hallelujah. When she looked at that son, hallelujah. And when she heard John the Baptist say that you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. And then she heard her own son say, I am going to baptize you with Holy Ghost. Her mind began to say, if the Holy Ghost in me produce this, what is the Holy Ghost in you? going to produce hallelujah oh hallelujah 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. oh hallelujah 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 glory Hallelujah. You still hanging with me? Jesus is the expressed image of Almighty God. But He is no longer on the face of this earth. And God decided that forever until He comes back again, He wants an expressed image of God on the face of this earth. And the only way He can do it is He's got to change us. He's got to pick us up from drunkards and dope addicts and change us until we look like God, until we talk like God, until we think like God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is hallelujah Woo. hallelujah Glory. Now Jesus got Jesus got ready to leave. And when he got ready to leave, he called them to the, his side. And he said, now I'm fixing to leave. But I leave you with the authority and the power and the glory of my spirit. He said, now go back to Jerusalem and you're going to be endued with this Holy Ghost. But not only that, not only will you have the essence of God, I'm going to give you the name of God. Hallelujah. Oh, you just ain't going to be able to produce the child. You're going to be able also to name the child and he said therefore baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost I not only have the holy ghost I have the name of the holy ghost on me through me and in me now Jesus said Jesus said these miracles I do and these works that I do greater works than these shall you do. Ooh, hallelujah. Now somebody said, how can we do greater works than God did? I'm fixing to show you. God in the form of Jesus Christ had an earthly mother but not an earthly father. But I have an earthly mother and an earthly father. My father's nature come from Adam, which was in direct opposition to God. But God said, the reason you're going to do a greater work is I'm going to take my spirit and put inside of you. And when my spirit gets inside of you, it's going to begin to change you. Hallelujah. 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 Earthly man bound by earth can't get off the earth but he's going to be able to do the miracles of a deity 
And when the world looks at him, they're going to see the God that's on the inside of him. Hey, church, you just didn't get the Holy Ghost to talk in tongues. You got the Holy Ghost for you to be changed into the image and the likeness and be conformed into the image of the Son. I'm waiting for some of you to come on to church. I think we left y'all at about 8.30, some of you. Hallelujah. Oh, but Brother Thompson, when I talk about the fact, somebody said, well, I got the Holy Ghost just to talk in tongues. I got the Holy Ghost, Brother Spirit. I was born again 30 years ago. Well, hold on. I'm fixing to pop the question. How much do you look like God? Come on. Glory. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. And yet you may have the last couple of nights, but I don't think you have. But I just want to be sure. But friend, we have taken long and precious pain. I do it in the church that I pastor. I have done it for 25, almost 30 years that I have traveled across this country and and across the world preaching this gospel. To preach, to change your outside and get your sleeves right and get rid of your jewelry. And don't ladies don't cut your hair. And men get good haircuts. And don't have a television. And, and don't have any of that. And don't dip snuff. And, and don't cuss. But the thing that bothers me the most is I have been able to get people to do that. But I have not been able to get them to consecrate in their heart. And even me myself until I began to take on the nature of this born again spirit inside of me. That wherever I I go people look at me and see me more than a Pentecostal but they see me as the son of God I told you last night my family was raised not very many miles from here my mother went to school at Negrit and uh, uh, some years ago I was not raised in that part of the country but I went to Negrit And if you've ever been there, uh, there was a store right across the road in front of Negrete High School. Uh, Nathan Wright runs that store. He's been running it since 1902, I think. He's the oldest man in this part of the world. Hallelujah. I didn't know Nathan Wright, but he knew my daddy when my daddy lived there 40-something years ago. And I walked in that store just a few years ago and Mr. Nathan Wright looked up and said, well, I'll be. Said, if you ain't Buddy Spears' boy. He said, I, 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 he said, you are Buddy Spears' boy, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. He says, my Lord, you look just like your daddy. Oh, I'm so hungry for the world to look at me. Hey, ladies, don't give up your holiness. Men, don't give up your holiness. But at the same time, let's find a prayer room till when we come out of the prayer room, somebody says, you look like your daddy. You look like your father. Oh, these works and greater works than these shall ye do. Oh, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Are you still staying with me? You see what I'm talking about? Glory. I don't know where you came from. But I'm convinced to believe that I'm looking at some men and women tonight that were one time drunkards. But you're not drunkards anymore. 
There's been a change in your life. But the change is not just to look like a Pentecostal church member. I'm not preaching to you a new doctrine. I'm just trying to make us aware of what this is inside of us. There's supposed to be some evolution going on inside of us. And I'm afraid we've got too many saints that your experience quit the night you prayed through to the Holy Ghost. And that's as far as you have ever matured in God. It's getting a little quiet on me now. We're still bragging about how many years we've been a talking in tongues. We've been a bragging about how many years we hadn't smoked a cigarette. We bragged about how many years we hadn't cut our hair. But the world is saying, I saw your hair. I saw you didn't smoke. But I'm more interested in seeing the Savior of the world. If you are the expressed image of God, let me behold God. Let me see God. Jesus said, when I leave this world, when I leave this world, I leave this world a witness. And the witness is the church of the living God. Somebody said, oh, Brother Spears, this world needs a Savior. Will you agree with me this world needs a Savior? I didn't get very many hands. Will you agree this world needs a Savior? Well, I'm going to tell you, this world has a Savior. The Savior is the church of the living God. But the church has not matured enough till it looks like God. All we look like is another religious group on the side of the road. We've got the outward holiness down, but we need an inward holiness to get a hold of us that we begin to act like God and think like God and talk like God. The reason we don't have healings in our church is because that nobody, and I'm pointing the indicting finger at this boy. I'm not standing here and telling you I've got it all worked out. But I'm telling you, I'm standing here telling you that this boy is stirred. I'm sick and tired of myself. I want somebody to pass by where I am and turn around and say, Ooh, what was that I felt when you walked by, sir? If Moses fellowship with it 40 days and had to put a veil on his face for men to look at him, I have had the Holy Ghost between 30 and 40 years. And I still don't look like God. I'll tell you why we have trouble with our youth. And I'll tell you why our youth has some trouble living for God. And I felt this yesterday and last night as I was studying. We have not presented to our youth an experience that we believe in strong enough dying for until our lives are changed by it. Somebody said, oh, but hey, just a minute. Mr. Mooney can get them by the untold thousands. And he requires more of his followers than we ever require of ours. You know why? It's because they see exemplified in him what he preaches. But I'm afraid enough of us don't see enough of God in enough of us preachers. And you're looking at one preach to you tonight. But I'll tell you what. I am so sick of myself. 
I am so tired of just being A.D. Spears. I want somebody to look at me and behold, not the tabernacle of myself, but I want them to see the glory that lives on the inside that's trying to change me into the image and the glory and the likeness of Almighty God. getting a little quiet are you still with me it's 9 30 and i'm not through yet i'm quit now but the best part of the message is almost yet to come you want me to go ahead or you want me to quit glory hallelujah we all quote that scripture now where the lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty And boy, that usually gets a rip roar out of a crowd. A testimony service, that'll always work. If you want one that'll work, that'll always work. Just get up in the crowd, hallelujah. And if you're a little down and out, just get up and quote that hallelujah. And Pentecostals will just say, oh, oh. I want to read to you the next verse. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image and from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord the spirit of the Lord is in this place tonight for you to look as though it is in a glass behold the glory of almighty God and as we behold the glory of God the glory of God is supposed to have a change on us and the more we fellowship with it the more we are supposed to look like it and in 40 days Moses came down from the mountain and he looked like the glory of the God that he fellowship with on the top of the mountain. And we are to be changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. And what is the Spirit? It's the Holy Ghost. And what is the Holy Ghost? It's the inward presence of Almighty God. May I tell you something and you will not think I am being critical or being crude or being snobbish or whatever. But I'm afraid that too many of our Pentecostal people do not totally understand the oneness of God. Because we think the Holy Ghost is a different type something than the God who made this whole world. And that's the reason when I say the Holy Ghost, you can feel good about it. But then when I say that God is dwelling inside of you, we have a problem with that. Hmm. But there's only one manifestation. Honey, if it ever gets a hold of you, that that's something, that feeling that's kicking around inside of your heart. Hallelujah. Ooh, glory. It's not church membership. It's not because you jabbered something one night at an altar. It's not because you jabber something right now. Hallelujah. What you feel is the glory of the mighty God inside of your heart. And the only reason you have the Holy Ghost is God says, I want you to be like me. And the only way I can make you like me is to put me inside of you. And as you are changed and fellowship, hallelujah, you will be changed into my likeness and into my glory. Oh, hallelujah. As Adam fellowship with God, he took on the mind of God. As Adam walked with God, he took on the authority and dominion of God. As I walk with God, hallelujah. As I move with God, hallelujah. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? The sons of God. What he simply means is that men are led by the Spirit on the inside. And as that Spirit leads them, it leads them from a lower life unto a higher life and 
from one glory unto another glory. We were Gentiles. We were outcasts. And we were dogs on the side of the road. But when God found us and decided to make a bride out of us, he said, I can't marry somebody that is a Gentile dog. So in order for me to marry them, hallelujah, I'm going to pick up the Gentile dog. But when I get through, I'm going to change them until they look like me and the world and the angels will look at them and they shall be the bride and they shall have my likeness and my glory and my power and my name and my authority. I run that by you again and throw some of you a curve. Do you think God is going to marry somebody that the devil can look at him and say, Ha ha, you had to marry somebody less quality than what you marry, what you are. I defeated you. And you had to marry somebody less quality. Oh no. Because my friend, I read to you 1 John 3 and 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. As far as I can find, that is the last verse where we are referred to as the sons of God. Because the final product. Whew, mm, hold on to your pew, because if you hadn't followed me now, you're probably going to want to get up and walk out and say the man's lost his mind. But the final product, hallelujah, the girl that God is going to marry is going to look like God. She's going to think like God. She's going to have the nature of God. Ooh, hallelujah. In fact, God is going to marry a glorified individual human being that has taken on the completeness of God and has become a deity in its own right by being changed into the likeness of Almighty God. And I read it to you. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Hallelujah. Honey, you can stay down in the dumps if you want to. I've got something working inside of me to change me into his image and his likeness and his glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And without controversy, everybody say controversy. Great is the mystery, everybody say mystery, of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels. God preached on into this world. Hallelujah, God was believed on. God was received up into glory. Huh? Is that the God that you worship? Now, let me go ahead and read another one. That was the expressed image of God. God was in the form of Jesus Christ. I read it to you. The mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit. Hallelujah. I read to you Romans 8. And it said, therefore we are conformed. And we are predestined to be conformed. Into the image and likeness of almighty God. And as we fellowship with his spirit. We are changed from glory to glory. But now, oh, this is the clincher. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That's it. Hallelujah. Just kind of get ready. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. And this is what it said. E even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints what is the mystery this is the mystery to whom God would make known hallelujah what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory oh hallelujah the Shekinah became the invisible God in the manifestation of Jesus Christ 
and that the invisible God became the visible manifestation in the form of the church. We have the mystery of all the generations in us. I have Christ inside of me. It is my hope of glory. Hang with me just a little bit longer. I'm almost through. God's will is to reproduce His life and live it out in us. That's exactly right. That's right. The will of God was to reproduce the mind of God in the body of Jesus Christ and God acted out and lived out in the body what was His will for this earth. Now, the will of God for the church. Are you taping this, buddy? Good, hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm running across some things. The Holy Ghost showing me right now that I don't have written down on paper. Hallelujah. Ah, my, my, hallelujah. How'd you be ready? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Nobody else may want this, but I want to preach this again. Hallelujah. My Lord, hallelujah. God's will is to reproduce the mind of God and the glory of God and the power of God and the mystery of God and make it visible into this present hour and this present generation. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hallelujah. They shall cast out devils and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Hey friend, I declare to you tonight, we will see the day before Jesus comes that the church reaches its potential and it has power over the devil and sickness and disease. It will happen. It will happen. And I'll give you an example of it. Peter and John, the Bible said, had been going to the temple to pray. But they were walking by again one day. And they made a statement which got a hold of me in the light of this message. And they said, hey man, look on us. We've been dwelling on silver and gold, have I none? But it's time we backed up and saw what the man saw. Because when he looked up, he didn't see fishermen. He saw the man called Jesus that had walked the shores of Galilee. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, I'll say it this way. When that crippled man, you see it? When that crippled man, I'll preach to you then, some of them don't see it. When that crippled man looked up, his mind told him there was a man called Jesus that walked the shores of this earth and he beheld God. Get ready to look on us because we are going to fellowship with the mystery until we are changed and we will be able to give you what you need. Glory. 
Hey, friend, there's a presence of the Holy Ghost in this place. Does anybody feel something happening in here, right here? Hallelujah. And happening right up here? I'm going to throw this one out to you. And I don't even have time to dwell on it because it got a hold of my heart on the way to church. But in the light of the message, I believe I've got to this congregation to a point now you can accept what I'm fixing to say. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. Paul said, let this mind be in you. Which was in Christ who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There is a mind of God that can raise us up to an elevation to where we can act like God and perform like God and obey God. Someday, someday, somewhere, when I don't know, where I don't know, and who I don't know, but somebody is going to keep changing until they lose their ego, they lose their name. They lose what they are and they take on the nature and mind of God. Then we will be able to say, look on us. I wished I had time to preach to you where Paul said, we have a treasure. The treasure is the glory of the Shekinah that's on the inside. That's what the treasure is. Holiness is your attitude of appreciation toward the treasure. That's the reason you can't legislate holiness and it will make people holy is because if you don't value something, nobody can make you value something. But the more valuable you think something is, the better security system you put on the outside. Please like, comment, and subscribe.